Hello, I'm Gary Kim, the editor of IP Business Magazine, and I'm here with Ken Zita, the president of Network Dynamics. Uh, let me ask you a question about open networks. We're hearing a lot about 700 megahertz spectrum and WiMAX and so forth. Is this important? Is it important? Openness, that's the story. I just, I love what's going on right now. I've been in this business a long time, and all of a sudden, this major break. First is the Verizon announcement. I think what they're doing in the mobile space by decoupling the handset from the network is maybe the biggest news I've seen in 10 years. I think it will profoundly transform mobile, but also really what we're getting into where uh, how applications are going to be resident on networks or not, how they're going to live in kind of a cyber free space and it will change the dimension of competition. Same thing's happening on Spectrum. Now, the FCC hasn't been exactly progressive in terms of the Spectrum policy, but the 700 auction with Google's help is really prizing open some really wonderful assets. And what happens in this country is, is resonating around the world. I mean, I'm seeing in various operating places where uh, we're active, advising governments on Spectrum, specifically in the Arab world, um, that there's a whole new thought about what that means. Because if you take it from the top down, if you open up the Spectrum, you open up a competitive policy, you change the way the money works, you change the way the service right. and creativity works, right. where innovation comes from, and yet another game change in terms of, you know, what is it that, uh, that ties a network to a, an application? Right, and it, yet you have to think that the entire global telecom industry has got to be frightened to death because what you're talking about essentially makes wireless the wireless internet. And they all know what happened to their ability to wall in profits and margin when the internet hit. Right, it is inevitable that we're going to have ethernet everywhere. We have IP everywhere, and we, you know, that's kind of a fun concept in terms of devices and networks and back-end infrastructure. But when you're actually getting to the service level, to have transparent, open Ethernet wherever you are continuously, it is a com complete change. Because the service providers no longer have the, the purchase on you as a transport carrier. Right now, transport is the only way to get access. But what happens when you have transport and then a free IP environment? Wonderful it's a big change. Mm -hmm. I think you know, Verizon's following BT in that sense. BT right. opened up its fixed network. Now Verizon's almost trumping them one better. They're still holding on to their fixed network. And with Fios, it's even more close in some respects. But on the mobile side, to be opening it up is kind of like a shot across the bow into the mobile space, trying to, I think, trying to one-up uh, Google. Now, given that this trend to openness appears to be inevitable, how does the business model of a traditional telco service provider possibly change in the future going Possibly forward? change. It change yeah. or die. Yeah. I, you know, I think where we're really headed is toward applications in general. And it's easy to say that. It's harder to know what it means. Because for 100 years, the telcos and in some ones the, the cable coast, because they've been, well, they're both transport providers. So they, their interest is to get as far as the termination block. And you can talk about content, but still content over transport. And as we move into an IP environment, a real IP environment, it's going to be all about software development. Actually designing things, products, service products, that people can use independent of how they're getting to them. So you have a powerful company with a big, uh, big industrial base and brand value, but what they're providing, the connectivity, now has to morph into something else. So those companies have to change. And they might do it by acquisition, they might do it with by acquiring um, application products the way, say, NTT Docomo is done by you know, having an ecosystem. But that's still not enough. It's not enough. They actually have to learn what people want to do. The old days, they just didn't care, right. you know? And now they have to care a lot to be smart enough to anticipate um, the new, new uh, revenue opportunities. Right. Now, if you had to give it a name, what is this new 21st century service provider going to be called? You know, I have some friends who are advising the CEO of uh, one of the big guys, one of the two big guys, and they ask this question, and I find it kind of amusing because they, they can't even name the business that they're trying to get in, and that irks them because they can't put their finger on it enough. So it's a digital business, a converged supplier. We have this same junky language that we've been using. The metaphors are old. They're tired. And none of those work. And none of them work. <laughs> but it is something about digital media or converged media. But there's also two ways, you know, there's two parts of the question. How do you understand it yourself from a, understand your business model? And how do you convey that to the market? And especially the retail market. In the old days, the enterprise market is what drove everything. Now it's the consumers. Consumers are right. everything. So what does a consumer need to say to themselves? I'm going to buy from that kind of company. 
And there's a really a challenge in this industry to um, not only get the business model right, but to learn how to teach the marketplace how to, to be accepting of, of people moving into multiple lines of business. So what be is a it? scary time. Scary time. It's, it's our time. <laughs> <laughs> well, great. Thanks, Ken. We appreciate you being here. And uh, thanks very much for watching. All right.